Morning, everyone. <laughs> How are you enjoying your NDC so far? Yay! Actually, that's pretty good for a Friday morning. I'm quite impressed, especially for those of you who went out last night. <laughs> really good going. <laughs> Uh, so I'm Jessica, I come from Nottingham in the UK, hence the accent is probably a bit different from what you expect for NDC Sydney. <coughs> and I work for a company called UniDays. Uh, the official tagline is for a student affinity network. We actually do verification for universities, uh, companies like Apple, and we're both, most well known for student discounts. And I work as a back-end engineer there, doing a lot of continuous improvement and that kind of stuff. But today, I'm going to be talking about creating and maintaining impactful dashboards. Uh, I'm currently modeling a lovely t-shirt by David Neal. I hope you went to go see his talk yesterday. It was fantastic. Turns out he sells uh, t-shirts on Amazon as well. So I'm just going to do a little quick plug because I like him. Anyway. Ooh. Sorry, my clicker has decided not to work. Hey, okay. So what is a dashboard and why should we care? Realistically, most of us use dashboards in day-to-day -day life without even realizing it. Whether it's doing your online banking on your phone, um, whether it's checking the thermostat in your house, especially if you're one of these people who are very good with IoT. If you are, please help me out. Um, but the one that's most common that a lot of people don't think about is a common car dash. Now, I really like this dashboard for numerous reasons. And whether you drive, whether you're a passenger, or whether you just like certain computer games, you're probably familiar with this. And the reason I like it is one of these dashboards where anyone who has seen one before can sit in front of it in any car. The design might be slightly different, but it doesn't take long to familiarize yourself with what's on it and the information you need to know. So I'm just going to go through this very quickly. But the first thing you sit down and see is the massive dial in the middle normally, the speedometer. And this makes sense because as you're driving, you need the information on this dial in real time. You're going too fast or too slow. There's quite big consequences. You could lose your license or you could get a heavy fine. But you need to react to this in real time. You have to either slow down or speed up as appropriate. You can't get this information in a delayed manner. Then you've got the kind of warning signals if we're going to go into dev levels. You've got your fog lights on, your indicator lights on. Don't need to react to it straight away. It's a bit of a hazard because other people in the road might be getting confused or blinded. But the consequences aren't as huge and you do need to react to it, but not as quickly as a speedometer. And then there's this git. The one that says, hey, you're going to spend money you can't afford to do. Um, yeah, you have to deal with this one, though uh, it turns out putting duct tape over it and pretending it's not there isn't actually dealing with it. Ask my dad. He was not happy to pay for my car bill. <laughs> um, but with this light, you do need to get to see to it, but you have to save up the money in the first place, and then you have to take a day off to go to the garage and get it sorted. I mean, seriously, duct tape is sometimes just the easier solution in my point of view. But as you've gone through this, you can see that each of these, you've got the information you need, you know exactly the actions you need to take, you know how quickly you need to take them, and you know the consequences, in other words, being yelled at by your dad if you don't actually take actions. So the car dash, it's pretty neat. So dashboards are also seen in films. Uh, I used to do a reference of Mission Impossible for this little bit, but it turned out there's too many people who asked me what that film was, and it made me feel ancient. So I got rid of that slide. But somebody comes in to some poor person surrounded by screens and asks that super save the world question. When's the asteroid going to hit Earth? When are we going to get this bad guy? And you see this, you know, you can only see the back of the head most of the time. You know they're rolling their eyes. Because they're going to have to look at all these screens, figure out from the information the answer. You have to do it quickly because it's a superhero and you know the world's ending again. And realistically, it's really difficult to process that much information at once and come up with the answer that they need. Let's change that question. 
we actually have to deal with superheroes or people who think they are on a day-to-day -day basis. The amount of times I've had somebody come to my machine, and this doesn't say anything about the companies I work for or my code before we go there. The amount of times we've got, why isn't this thing working? How many users are we going through this? And they expect the answer like that. But sometimes it involves delving through logs or going, don't ask me, ask Barry, he'll deal with this situation. Or just trying to find the time where you can concentrate and get this answer for them. This is where dashboards come in. Because if you have the ability to have real-time information, if you need it, you've got information in the context that you need, you can easily understand to it, you know how to react to certain bits of it, and you know how to read it, much like that car dash, you can give those answers much quicker. Quicker? Quickly. So who needs dashboards? I'm going to go through three different types of dashboarding in a business. Um, these aren't all the different types of dashboards. It's a very big area, but this will give a nice little overview, hopefully. And everybody likes cookies, right? So I'm going to try and apply an example of a cookie factory for each of these. Business intelligence. This is a sort of dashboard that uh, upper management use. Anybody who's communicating with stakeholders, investors, they need to have the grand idea of what's happening with the business. As such, they need to have an idea of the health of the business. This involves a number of things. Um, I actually had a few conversations when I was learning about this area, and before I did it, I thought it was kind of statistical voodoo or realistically actually thought they're just pulling stuff out of various areas of their anatomy, but it turns out that's not the case. Um, realistically, they're using customer models, so statistical models of their customer behavior, who their customer is. They're considering temporal factors, so how is the business doing compared to last year? How does it look like it's going to do? It can also include kind of events, so a biscuit factory might consider Valentine's, Christmas, Halloween when we eat a lot more sweet things. And there's a white paper, unfortunately I can't remember who by, I should remember this, which describes the levels of these dashboards in kind of a war analogy, which I quite like. So business intelligence would be your strategic, how to win that war. So there's lots of things that are going, but they need to know the bigger picture, the direction of what we're gonna be doing, the actual point of the war in the first place as well. In terms of a business, this could be how are we going to make X amount of money in a certain amount of time? It could be how, much, how are we going to get a certain amount of customers? Like, What do we need to do to make our business successful and to beat our competitors? So yeah, cookie factory, let's go with we're going to make 100 million in the next quarter. So how do we get there? Management information. So <laughs> this is the bit where you can tell I've memorized this sentence. But this is the directly financial impacting uh, information of a business. In common speak, uh, you see some person with an Excel sheet in front of them, they could probably do with this kind of dashboard. It's product, it's marketing, it's finance, it can be HR. Uh, I'm not going to go into that in this particular talk, but feel free to have a chat afterwards about that. Um, but it's anyone who actually has an impact on the finances of a company. Perfect for our example. In terms of our war analogy, it's how do you win each battle towards that war? Wars aren't really won in one massive battle, although we hear about the big famous ones, it's lots of small ones. So what's the small pieces going towards achieving that big goal? So our cookie factory again. I'm gonna talk about marketing because I get to draw prettier pictures for marketing, in all honesty. But there we go. So we've got that grand goal of we're going to achieve a certain amount of money in the next quarter. Marketing need to figure out something that they can do to help towards this goal. And they decide to put an advert on TV. Simple idea actually involves quite a lot of information to pull it off. Again, you've got those customer models, the same as business intelligence had. Part of this might be OK, are we targeting at families? If so, we probably don't want this advert during the day when kids are at school or too late in the evening when they've gone to bed. I know, evil targeted marketing, but it works. Again, there's temporal factors. 
if we've got um, Halloween coming up, etc., or if there's a sports game on and you're doing a particular branded biscuit. And this comes into cost versus profit. Now, with adverts on TV, you can pay different amounts depending on the length of advert, but also when they're shown. So if you've got a 10-second advert right after a national sports game, that's going to be much more expensive than a 30-second one after... Oh, I would normally go for Jeremy Kyle here, but I don't know the Australian equivalent. Um, but you get what I mean, daytime TV. So you have to consider, A, if you're actually going to make the money that you need to make, otherwise we're not achieving that business goal, we're not helping towards it, for the cost it takes to do this thing. If you've done it before, this is great, because you've probably put some monitoring in place, because you're fantastic people. I can see this about you. And that means that you can compare what happened last time, learn from it, improve, much like we would with any science experiment. If you don't, you want to have those baselines in place. You want to know exactly what our environment is right now and see the effect the advert's having, whether this is this time last year or this time last week. I'm sure that we all did those kind of science experiments in school. The one I think of is the one where you throw stuff into water because I like the big explosions. We had a beaker of water, it's kind of boring, nothing happened, that's your original environment. Then you threw in something like sodium and went to see what happened. You're throwing in is your TV advert. So what happened is if you're actually getting people spending their money. This is the other thing. If you're going to do this, just measuring how many people are hitting your site isn't actually answering your question. You want to see who's throwing money in the basket and actually spending it. Uh, lessons learned. <laughs> Turns out it's not, you need to think about that end goal. Uh, management information and business intelligence have a big impact on each other. All right, this is pretty bad drawing, but uh, <laughs> there's a reason for this. So going back to that war analogy, we've got how to win the war. We've got how to win each battle. So we've got a lot of generals moving pegs around on a map, if it's going to kind of what you normally see in a film. With all the best plans in the world, you're not going to achieve anything. You actually need to do some doing. So this is execution level, which in our war analogy would be the front line. So I've gone for a big sparkly firework because I could get really graphic with this, but I think people might leave the talk. This is the people who are driving the tanks, who are shooting the guns in our war analogy. In our biscuit factory analogy, there's our cookie monster again, it can be what's operating the uh, hardware that actually makes the biscuits through to how our website's running. It's everything from hardware, software, infrastructure, because without your factory and without the ways of buying stuff or advertising stuff, you're not going to make any money. You can sit around and talk about it all day, but it's not going to happen. Execution in terms of a business dealing with technology, it can include developmental and operational information. Now, this is where it gets a bit fuzzy, as I'm sure you can all tell if you've been to a few of the DevOps talks, etc., because it depends very much on your company size and structure. You might have a separate dev and ops team. You might be working in a more DevOps environment. All good, all fine. But the responsibilities also overlap as well on depending on how you're organized. For the purpose of this talk, uh, this isn't like a definition, but it's, it's OK for this. I'm going to describe operational as how an environment works on production, and uh, developmental as if it's working as expected just to try and stay away from those gray areas. Realistically, these teams are looking at the same stuff with a slightly different focus. So say your database is running a bit slower, your operational team will probably be looking at the environment it's running on, CPU, memory, et cetera. Your developmental team might be looking at some code that they've really written, uh, recently written. I've seen occasional database locking calls been responsible for a couple in the past. Um, async is hard. <laughs> uh, so they might be looking at the interactions with the database and how that's having an effect. Indexing, eh, it, it depends on how your company's structured. I've seen it work in both teams. 
but they're looking at solving the same problems, just with a different focus, which means they probably need to be talking to each other at the very least. Which is where dashboarding comes in again. It's helpful for that communication. So just to round off that example, we've had uh, the business say we want to make money, we've got marketing information putting out a TV advert. What impact is this going to have on us? Well, you've also got to find out, like, can our factory make all these biscuits that we're suddenly going to be having bought? But easy one is the website. Let's say you're going to get an increased uh, amount of orders on your website. Can we deal with that load? Uh, if you can do load testing before this, fantastic. Load testing is a really hard thing to do. But we need to know that if if we can deal with the load, and if we can't, you know, we can fix it relatively quickly, and that we're being alerted about it. So, so far, I've kind of talked about this in a very unilateral direction. Business needs to know about management information, vice versa. Management needs to know about ops, vice versa. This isn't always the case. Um, actually, it's never the case, to be honest. So a company I worked for had the grand idea that with the all-hands meeting, we have uh, bonuses very much tied to how the business performance is doing, much like you do in most places. So I thought, right, we'll put all the management information goals on a graph, and the end of this graph will be what our business intelligence thing is. We want to achieve this amount of money in this amount of time. I think I've got a laser, ooh, laser pointer. How are we doing towards that? And this worked well, but there was certain bits of it that didn't really make sense with the projects. So they added in some um, execution level information. When has the system gone down? When a service is not available? Now, A, this is really good information to have. Like, how are our projects having an impact on the business? That's quite cool. Are we actually going to get our full bonus at the end of the year? Great. But it had an effect we didn't expect because Yes, we thought it'd be great to have this transparency of the information, but more c conversations were happening. Suddenly, we had people going, oh, have you just done that? That affects a project that we're planning on doing. Can we have a discussion? Or suddenly, more people were talking to the tech department to find out exactly how they implemented something, if it's possible for them to get their work done in the future that's closely connected. And not only that, we we're all working towards the same thing. It wasn't all these departments working on their own projects. You could see how everything was connected. And we're all working towards that one purpose of the business intelligence goal. It created a sense of unity. And I was actually very surprised about the social effect of dashboarding. So it turns out it's not a kind of unilateral direction. It's everyone talking to each other. So who needs dashboards? You could probably tell this before you even like <laughs> before you even change the slide, but dashboards can be used to set baselines, make achievable plans, track projects, but they also have this amazing social effect, creating a sense of unity and purpose, having everybody on the same page, having that sense of transparency. And this is kind of why I get excited about this thing. I know it's a graph on a screen, but I really believe in the effect it can have. This quote's from a book that a friend lent me, and it goes back to that thing I was saying about doing experiments in school. Have your baseline, do something to have an effect, and then see what happens. If you're not measuring these things, you don't know your influence, you can't manage it, you definitely don't know if you're having an improvement on a system. You'd be throwing anything out and just putting people off. Let's face it, how many of us have gone to a website and like five adverts have popped up on the screen and we've just closed that thing straight down again? That's not their intention. They want to get people to go to these things, but they're clearly not monitoring what's going on. <laughs> and if you can't measure things, you really can't influence them in the way you want to. So do you really care? Now, I have done this talk at a couple of meetups, and whenever I ask if people find dashboarding a bit more of a hindrance than a bore than actually helpful, a yeah, lot of hands go up. And there's a simple reason for this. Dashboarding's hard to do right. It's a simple concept. I mean, we've all seen a car dash. We find it amazingly useful. But it's easy to go wrong with it. And I'm going to go through a few situations and where this can happen, why, and what to do about it. 
There's numerous danger signs, more than I've drawn up here. Um, and I am going to just talk about dashboarding, but these go for all forms of monitoring. If you've got fatigue with your alerts, if your logs are not making sense, like reassess these things in the same way. These are all important tools. So don't know what metrics are for. One of the companies I worked for uh, had a lot of dashboards. And there was a big red 72 on one of them, which is always present on the screen. Now, red's not a good color. So I started to wander around going, what does this mean? Like, do we have to do something? And I literally never got the answer. It was just people going, huh, I don't know. <laughs> really worrying, which is actually where my interest in all this started. Uh, it turned out it was actually a nonsensical string. I don't even know why it was there, but never mind. Maybe it was just to kickstart this interest. But if you don't know what the metrics are for, why the hell do you have them on your walls or on your screens? It's an easy situation to get into. I, when you're sitting in a car, you're in that context. You know exactly what this information is talking about. Fair enough. And you've got all these dials. You know, you know what you need to do. Cool. It's not so easy with dashboards. Like you might be in an area of a system. Let's go for dev because that's what I am and that's what I know. But what's the context? Is it just that little bit that you're looking at? Is it the project you're working on? And who's using this dashboard? Is it the devs who are going to be using it for figuring out where they need to do their tracing and debugging? Or is it somebody a few desks along that needs to see if their project's working? Like you need to consider your audience. And then what do they need to do? Like, I, I've probably, I'm going to try and avoid this rant, but if somebody turns up and goes, well, it might be interesting. One more time, I'm going to get a giant foam mallet. <laughs> and I cannot be responsible for my actions. Because, yeah, everything's interesting. Like, if we didn't think things were interesting, we wouldn't be doing this job. <laughs> Doesn't mean it's useful. <laughs> um, so only have things that are useful on your dashboards. Because otherwise, this comes up constantly. And part of the thing that's responsible for this is tick box exercises. Now, we have it as part of our definition of done that monitoring should be in place. And I totally agree with that. I still think that is a thing to do. But I've had it where I've worked in a team and you know, we have our post-it note going, make a dashboard. And at the end of the sprint, you want to get the work done. You pick it up, you're like, uh, throw this metric on there. And yeah, that'll do. That, that, that looks pretty. That's fine. Put that on the wall. And you haven't had those conversations again. Why are you tracking this stuff? What are you doing? So we've actually inverted this now in our team. We make our dashboards first. We have the conversations with our stakeholders, see what they need, make a board for them. We talk with each other, say, hey, where can this go wrong, and monitor those things. And of course, it's completely useless in the beginning. But as we build up those systems, we start to get the information coming through, and we know if we're having that effect that we wanted in the first place. So don't just have it as a tick box exercise. Have a reason for d making the things you're doing. This one just makes me giggle. Uh, <laughs> does anybody have this in their company? I feel really sorry for whoever this person is. <laughs> oh, Mark. <laughs> I'll buy you a drink later. <laughs> um, so. We've talked a lot here about one word, really, communication. How many people do you have to talk to on a daily basis, Mark? <laughs> uh, they know that you've got a, a rubber mallet as well, is it? Yeah. If you're going to be working on projects and systems, you need to be knowing how they're behaving. And like, hey, this is a boring. I've been here myself. It's a boring thing to do, making dashboards for other people on projects you're not necessarily working on as well. It, it's not great. But you're cutting off an entire line of conversation. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to put a picture of Mark here for the next time I do this, though. Ha, <laughs> ha, 
I've got a slide coming up that uh, you might enjoy that. <laughs> um, yeah, I I'm really sorry for all of you. Like, really sorry. So where do you start? Well, this is part of what Mark was just saying. Like, even when you're having the conversations with stakeholders, saying, what do you want? Personally, I want a bathtub full of Ben and Jerry's and a really good book. Uh, I'm not going to get it. What do I need? Probably some vegetables, <laughs> in all perfectly honesty, and definitely some sleep. Um, so change the way you're framing your questions. What do you need? Do they align to a certain objective or key performance indicator? The uh, how might it fail is always an interesting conversation because people don't really like to tell you that they know about how it might fail. Uh, we like to avoid failure as much as possible, but it's, it's things you need to know about. And how do you know if an app or feature is working? If they just say it's up, A, give them a smack, and B, actually you know, push them further, because my application form could be up, doesn't mean I can submit it. <laughs> like, try and find out again, how might it fail? What is it that you're actually looking for? And this is the bit that I think uh, is what we were just talking about. Does anybody have children or look after children in this room? OK, quite a few. I've got a goddaughter. Um, she's adorable and terrible all at once. And I think of her when I have to have these conversations, because when you're doing this, just channel that inner toddler. You know that really adorable phase where they keep asking questions, and you kind of want to throw them out a window? be that toddler. <laughs> like, it is exactly what Mark was just saying there. Like, don't just let them go, I want it in the middle. It's cool, and I want to know this stuff. Ask them why, and you know, does it actually need to live on a dashboard? If you're doing calculations and modeling on it, it probably needs to go in a store somewhere. You're not going to get that from a graph. And what does it provide? Like, why are we measuring this thing? How long do we need to measure this thing for? This is how we end up with a lot of de dead information on dashboards and end up with that <laughs> 72. <laughs> Who knows? Like, could it live somewhere else? Try and push people to not just be lazy and go, I want the pretty picture. Make them think about how they're using it. Don't throw yourself on the floor screaming. Turns out that doesn't go so well in meetings. But, you know, a bit of foot stamping is fine. Channel the inner toddler. Because at the end of the day, dashboards should evolve. We're measuring projects and businesses and systems. All these things are relatively complex, have a lot of moving parts, but they evolve. They change. If they're not changing, we're probably doing something very wrong. And dashboards are the same. Like, I'm going to keep going back to the systems thing because it, it's where I live. But if I'm going to change a part of the system, it's going to be unstable for a bit. So I need to make sure that that dashboard has the information I need to know that I'm not breaking everything and there's not going to be screams upstairs. <laughs> You'd be surprised. <laughs> Sometimes there's literal screaming. But, and uh, I need to know that the thing that I'm changing, if it's a new feature or a product, is that working as I expect? If I'm trying to make something more performant, I can't just you know trigger the screen and Look at my clock. <laughs> it's not going to work. I need to have the monitoring in place. But likewise, if I go back to a dashboard, I can have a look and go, right, what aren't we using anymore? Try and delete some of the stuff that's no longer there. And I'm going to quickly go back to that advert again. Not everything lives forever. That advert is only going to be useful for that particular situation, for that particular context. So if I was talking to that stakeholder, I'd be like, right, when are you going to use this information? When's this advert going offline? That's when this is going. Like, don't necessarily have to delete it. You can store it somewhere for them. But tell them, right, once you've got what you need, this information is going, and I'll make a new one next time. Because you're going to have to have these conversations again. It's not always applicable for every situation. Which brings me to this. 
as I've said, there's many different types of dashboard, but they're shown in different cases. Your MI and BI, uh, business intelligence, management information, mostly shown in meetings of some form, you know. It's, uh, yeah, we're making the money, look, we're doing great, ooh, hide the ones where it's going downhill. It's, it's for those conversations, it's an aid for that. You can also have journey, project, and feature dashboards. This is something we used to do in a company I used to work for. Because we had rotating dashboards, we had uh, a level which was the kind of KPIs for that project. And that was always on our dev dashboard as well. So that if anyone was coming along and wanted to have a conversation about the work we were doing, it's the context thing again. You go, OK, we've been asked to do this piece of work. This is how the other dashboards tie into that. This is how we're performing with it. And we train our stakeholders on what to look up for on that. Because sometimes when you're sitting next to a screen, you don't really look at it as much as you should do. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I, I've been guilty of having a screen switched off next to me for a good couple of hours before I realized. It happens, it happens. And then you've got the execution level. So operations and development have been using dashboards probably longer than any of these other teams. We have to deal with these big black boxes with lots of moving parts in. So by measuring the edge cases, it's a lot easier to figure out what's going on and where you need to look. There's different forms. I mean, you've got, I'm talking about standards like health monitoring here, but you've got performance monitoring, security monitoring, front end monitoring, back end monitoring. Uh, you're using it for trying to figure out where the weaknesses in your system are. If you've got effective at using these things, and that's great, seeing how you can fix things. So you're using it for, kind of tracing your problems as well as actually seeing the overall health of your projects. And this is kind of the lower levels. Really nice trick is if you can have like a project level one that you can click through. <laughs> uh, it saves you trying to have to juggle like six different dashboards. I've recently done this on Grafana and it saved me a load of time. But just have them on rotation, but have them in front of the people who actually need them because they're the ones who actually care. Question I get a lot, what the hell should you be using? Uh, I've mentioned Grafana, I like it a lot, but it's for a purpose. I've actually used quite a few of these, um, but all of these kind of have their own specialisms. Zabbix is great for operational stuff. StatsD is a telemetry tool. Um, then you've got Tableau, which is more BI. Obviously Power BI is kind of more in that range. Elastic seems like a super tool. Uh, used it for far too many things, if I'm in all honesty. But it depends on what you're doing and what tool you want to use. First of all, this is a wall of text, but make sure that you're asking the questions you need to do. Um, user and development concerns, one of the most important ones to me on here is the bottom one. Either have somebody on your team who has experience of using the tool. If you don't have anyone who's got that experience, make sure the documentation is absolutely pucker because it's really easy to mess up <laughs> on any form of monitoring. And if you haven't had someone who has lived that pain and when you mention the tool, kind of goes into the fetal position in the corner and starts crying, uh, then you're not gonna avoid those pain points without like very lucky conversations. So make sure that it's easy to learn. You've also got, uh, can it cover the type of queries you're gonna be using? Makes sense, you need it to cover those questions. What data sources does it support? Can you just plug and play with your UI? The does it need to be accessible? This is more for if you've got different levels of dashboard again. Can you just pass a dashboard on to somebody in marketing without giving them access to all of the dev information? Because a little bit of information and a lot of ignorance can lead to a really annoying situation where people think they know what your dev dashboards are doing and you'll just end up killing them. So just don't let them see them. What's the budget? Do you want to self-host? Do you want to have a hosted solution? You need to be able to afford these things. I love Elastic, it's great, but uh, I've certainly had that conversation where it's got a little bit expensive and I need to figure out how to make it cheaper again. And does it al uh, support alerting that's useful to you? Slack, text messaging, email, whatever people are actually using. So when I first did this talk at a meetup, I got challenged by a friend to put Scylla Black into my presentation. So I know that uh, blind dates is an Australian thing as well, right? 
or it used to be, no? It was a dating show in Britain with the crazy Liverpudlian lady. But it actually works quite well for uh, this example. So just treat it like you're on a dating show. Ask the questions that you really need in your life. And the tool that gives you the majority of right answers, eh, it's probably the one for you, right? <laughs> Hopefully. This is kind of how I approach it. It's a bit of fun as well, and you get to be old Zilla. But yeah, <laughs> this is too much of an insight into how I work. <laughs> I'm sorry, my coworkers, I am that annoying. But yeah, just treat it like you're trying to pick your other half because you're going to spend more time with your dashboarding tool than you are with them for a lot of it. So where can you learn more? Oh, I have thundered through this. Practical Monitoring is a great starter for 10. Um, it's a very small book but it covers a variety of different monitoring and it gives business examples of how different companies have used it, why, etc. cetera. Thing with this, yes, Spotify, Netflix, Etsy in particular, the Etsy blog on monitoring is fantastic. If you haven't read it, they're open about everything they do. They have some really cool stuff they do and they do it really well. Just because these huge companies are doing it doesn't ne necessarily mean it's right for your startup or even for your huge company. Like, try and ask the same questions that they're doing, but don't necessarily go, that implementation is the way forward. This is how we must do all the things, because it's probably not going to be right for you. Um, and this book actually kind of goes into that a little bit and why, which is good. Practical monitoring, great. And one day, Mike Julian will give me some money for plugging his book so much, maybe one day. Uh, there's also my blog. Uh, there's going to be a few new things going up on it soon, I, I, I promise. But this goes into the talk I've just done more in depth. Uh, I talk a lot about some of the work I've done in companies and what's gone wrong. Uh, because this is the best way to learn. You are surrounded by amazing people in, from pretty awesome companies. And even if the company they work for right now, they hate, they probably work somewhere pretty cool, so it's fine. But talk to them, find out what they're doing, whether it's about monitoring dashboarding, whether it's about DevOps or Kubernetes or whatever that's really got you interested. Talk to the people around you. When I first started in this area because of that Red 72, I started, I actually put out a tweet kind of going, what's this dashboarding malarkey about? And it ended up with me talking to various companies in my local area, having coffee, seeing what they did, applying it to my own place, which is great, but it avoided so many of those pain points. And it also enabled for when I got stuck, I could go, ah, I broke it, <laughs> help me. And suddenly there was loads of people who were willing to go, oh yeah, I've done that before, don't worry about it, just fiddle around. Make use of your community because they are the best source of information you've got and also Sometimes you just need a shoulder to cry on. Mark, we'll need hugs. So we've covered a lot very quickly. Uh, very, very quickly, I apologize for that. But there are many different layers and types of dashboard. Dashboards are great for unity, transparency, and purpose. Go back to your company and talk to the other levels of your business if you can. Find out how they use information. You might even be able to help which would be great, but using dashboards to create that sense of community and communication, I think is one of the most powerful things they can do. Um, and I know it's harder for the larger businesses. I've worked in a lot of small businesses, I'm lucky. But by having kind of a communication culture, you'll gain so much more out of the place you work. Scientific method. We learned it when we were kids, people. You need to know the baselines of your environments to know if you're having an effect. <laughs> uh, it's the same for anything we do. And also, it, you get a nice little shiny feeling when you see that graph go up, if it's supposed to go up. It's pretty depressing if it's doing that, it's supposed to go down, but at least you know that you've had a bad effect. Consider your audience. Who's looking at this dashboard? Who needs the information? Don't put all the information in one place because it's gonna be confusing to whoever's using it. You need that sense of context. Asking the right questions and pushing back, channeling that inner toddler. 
making sure that you're not just putting stuff on a graph because it's interesting. The mallet has been ordered. Asking the right questions and pushing back. <coughs> Layers of a dashboard. Where do they need to be seen? Who needs to see them? Do you need a little rotating graph thing? Is your screen on? Tooling and picking the right tool for you. Just pretend you're in a dating show. It's great fun, honestly. But making sure you're asking the right questions to make sure you get the right tool. Um, and you know what? If you pick the wrong tool, it's honestly not the end of the world. It's going to do the majority of the things that you want, or at least deal with some area of your business. And it's not overly hard to change tool. Eh. They're very similar. There's a lot of them. But it's not the end of the world. And resources. Talk to everybody around you. They're all great. NDC is one of my favorite conferences, and it's full of amazing people. And unfortunately, I can't go because I'll be jumping on a flight after this. But PubConf, you know, people talk way more after they've had a couple of beers. <laughs> it's great. But yeah, go to PubConf. It's funny. It's, you'll meet people you wouldn't otherwise talk to. And you get to see all the speakers embarrass themselves. And Well, I'm doing it up here anyway, but they do it even more there. There's no cameras. So that was a whirlwind tour of creating impactful dashboards and why you should. Thank you for listening. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, so for a business group that might not be sure what they want on a dashboard, if I were to actually have them, what would you recommend in terms of like an exploratory dashboard to try and figure out what they want? OK, yeah, interesting question. So for a business who uh, doesn't necessarily know what they want on a dashboard, uh, should you consider exploratory uh, dashboarding? Is that okay summary? Yeah. 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 Uh, interestingly, doing this slightly at the moment, so we use exploratory dashboarding for figuring out our alerts in particular. Um, this is a short-lived dashboard of the things that we kind of know the behavior of, but don't know them too well, and we need to find out the levels of where we need to alert against. And then we tear down that thing um, because we have a lot of alert fatigue otherwise. So it's trying to find that fine line without somebody's phone going off every two seconds. I don't have a problem with exploratory dashboarding at all as long as you've considered the lifetime again. So at some point, you need to decide the information you actually need and get rid of the bits you don't. Um, but I would go back to what your service level agreements, if you're in kind of operations and dev and making sure that you're treating your partners right really should measure those because <laughs> you can get fined pretty heavily in some companies if you don't meet them um, but also consider kpis and company objectives those are a great place to start and then go fine grained down from there because if you start with a fine grained it's going to be hellish to pick apart does that answer the question yeah. cool anyone else oh Ooh. From your um, developmentally, uh, somebody on the team who's working on that project because they're close to it. Ideally, someone who can communicate well uh, without being too aggressive about being a toddler because that doesn't end so well. But yeah, definitely people who are working on systems should be dealing with their own systems dashboards. Same with operations. Um, I'm actually getting a great learning experience at the moment because I'm sitting with an operations uh, person for one hour every week and helping them with what they do and vice versa so I can learn more about their world. It's a really great way of teaching that sort of stuff. In terms of uh, business and marketing, it tends to land on dev a lot because of some of the tooling is a little bit more fiddly for someone who's not technical. Uh, the example I gave of the mixed MIBI dashboard that actually had an Excel data source because we knew that the people who were dealing with it knew how to use Excel. So we made sure that they could change it themselves, save a bit of a job, but also they know the information that's going on it and had a stakeholder for that board. Stakeholders for boards, really good thing because it means that you have one person to direct your questions to and also to nag when there's bad information on there. Um, but again, that one's quite hard because it depends on your business. It's probably going to land on dev, unfortunately. But as long as they're sitting next to somebody who's actually using it 
and making sure the information is there is the best you're going to get. <laughs> Any war stories? No? Okay, well, thank you very much. I'll let you go get some coffee and enjoy the rest of your Friday. And thank you for being a lovely audience. <laughs>